Excellence Commission, NURA, all our partners, as well as the Falls uh, Prevention uh, Network, um, I'd like to welcome you to the 13th, 13th annual uh, Falls Prevention Forum. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the past, future, the, the Gadigal people of your Aura Nation and on whose land we stand today. We have had over 400 registrants for today and we are going to hear from a range of uh, experts, uh, clinicians in both the CUTE, the community and the rest so we, ha we have a wonderful day planned. I hope that you will all uh, learn and share, and I'm sure you will. And uh, I'm going to now ask you to welcome Uncle uh, Alan Madden, a Gadigal elder, for the welcome to country. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal elder. I was going to say something then, but I, I, I just feel like a song coming on. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at all you fellas here, and you're a happy bunch. But I won't. <laughs> at the after party tonight. <laughs> uh, first of all, two apologies for the terrible weather we're having outside at the moment. Sorry. And I've been able to welcome you to my country and my language, as we were forbidden to talk our language a long time ago. As we've all welcomed the countries, I'd like to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects. To all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here today, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things shorter than that, coming, taxation and going. It is an honour and pleasure to be here today to welcome one and all to Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north, the Pean to the west and George's River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers, is the Eora Nation, and in that nation there are 29 clans, and the clans land we're on today is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as you travel across these traditional lands and waters, may the spirits of our ancestors guide look over you and keep you safe. So once again, on behalf of Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uncle. Um, we might move on now to hear from Dr. Nigel Lyons, who is the uh, secretary, the deputy secretary of strategy and resources. And Nigel has a long history in healthcare. Uh, in fact, uh, I've worked under Nigel twice. Um, most recently, Nigel uh, has worked as the chief executive of the Agency of Clinical Innovation, and also a period of time uh, for the Clinical Excellence Commission as well. Uh, Nigel's been very active in a range of areas and we're going to hear from him talking about a, a couple of key strategy areas including uh, leading better value healthcare. Thank you, Nigel.
Thanks, Harvey, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Important day. Can I start off by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present, and future, and in particular, thank Uncle Alan for his uh, warm welcome to country. Um, as uh, was mentioned, this is the 13th annual forum. Uh, it's amazing that uh, the work that has been undertaken over the years uh, to support improvements uh, in the care of people who are, are at risk of falls in, in, uh, in a range of settings that we have. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the work of all of you, but I want to particularly call out Lorraine Lovett, uh, who has been uh, involved in this work right since the inception. I remember uh, in 2005, when we started in this, uh, in this work, uh, Lorraine was going around all of the health services at that stage, and we held a forum in the health service I was in at the time, Hunter New England, uh, and uh, very important that we started to have a focus on uh, this area which is causing major uh, mortality, morbidity and psychosocial impact for people. Uh, and uh, I just want to call out and acknowledge Lorraine's work and, and her leadership in this space and thank her for that over 13 years. Uh, in, in opening today, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, call out a couple of things that we're doing at the moment. And there is a renewed focus on falls, particularly in the acute sector at the moment. And that's as a result of a focus on a whole uh, program of work in New South Wales Health called uh, Better Value Care. And the whole concept that is driving this renewed focus is that we need to be thinking much around uh, a range of things that will, pr will actually ensure that our patients, families and their carers are receiving the optimal care that we can within the resources that we have available. To do that, we know that we don't always get it right in terms of applying evidence into practice. Also, we don't always get it right in terms of delivering consistently the care that we should deliver. Uh, and I think as, as, our, as our patients have grown older and more frail, we haven't adjusted and adapted our services and our approaches and our systems uh, to support that adequately. And, it, and there is a need for us to all think about the fact that we have been so, so successful in acute health care and curative medicine that we now have many people in our community who are living with chronic conditions, who are older, and more importantly, are much more frail. And so what do we need to do to adapt and adjust our care? So that the whole evidence base around the importance of nutrition, uh, maintaining activity, uh, ensuring that we don't decondition people when they're in our acute care facilities is really important to focus areas for us all. In the context of, the context of that and the better value care work, started off by focusing on a range of clinical areas. We decided to try and tackle this, and I was just talking to someone about the challenges you face when you've got such a large system with so many things that you can do. How do you actually identify where you start? And so what we looked at is, where was there some good evidence around the things that we could do to make a difference? Uh, where had there been good work that had been undertaken in the system previously that we could build on? Where were there coalitions of people who have a desire to make improvements in that cohort of patients? And where did we see that we had clear opportunities to do things better? And so we focused on eight areas to start with. A number of them were clinical cohorts of patients, but also importantly in that group has been a focus on falls in acute care. And we focused on that because it is doing harm to our patients. And it's also an area where we had seen improvement when we had focused on it initially, but that improvement had plateaued. And by comparison with many other states around the country, our performance was not as good as other states. So what do we need to do to focus our attention, to get the improvement, to make a difference? And uh, that has been uh, underway now uh, as a renewed focus, building on all the good work that's been undertaken over many years. And we're now starting to see improvements again, which we hope we will continue to build on. So the, in the first couple of quarters of uh, this year, uh, we started to see a reduction in the rate of falls per thousand bed days across our acute facilities and the rate of falls in relation to admissions. So we're very encouraged by those changes and we are uh, looking forward to continuing to see that improvement through all the good work that all of you do as well. But very importantly, it's not just about acute care, it's about what happens in residential aged care and how we can support improvements in, in that environment and also ensuring that we have that connection with the care in the community. 
and uh, having a focus on acute is just the start. I'm sure that we will continue uh, to focus our attention in those other environments as well, which are very important. Just wanted to mention one before I finish up and the importance of patient reported measures as a driver of change. And one of the things that we're very conscious of is that as health systems and health providers, um, we talk about the fact that we're patient-centred. We talk about the fact that we listen to the patients and we tailor our care to their particular needs. But I think there's a sense that we have that as providers we still continue to do what we think is the right thing for our patients and don't always tailor our approach to what they're seeking from our care and the outcomes they're looking for. And this is particularly so in the context of chronic conditions where people will be cared for by a number of practitioners and by multidisciplinary teams, which is really important focus. How do we ensure that we anchor back our care to the particular needs and ensure that we're actually delivering what they're looking for? And so we're introducing as a part of this whole change in better value care, uh, patient reported measures as a focus. It'll be in two areas, patient experience, so what is the experience of the care that's being delivered? And that will be collected and fed back reasonably quickly to the clinical team so that they can get feedback directly about the experience that patients, carers and families are seeing from the care. And then also, what are the outcomes of care? So how do we ensure that we define the outcomes so we get to agreement from patients, carers about the outcomes that they see are important, start to collect measures around those and feed those back to teams on a regular basis so that they can see how they're performing in relation to delivering to those outcomes and can monitor their performance over time and can also benchmark their performance with teams that are do doing similar work in, in other places. And we're very conscious that as a system we don't do this well. We've got pockets of excellence around this, around our system, but we don't do it systematically. And we see this as going to be a really important driver of change and improvement right across our system. And we're very committed to making this change. So I just thought I'd mention those couple of things uh, in, in, uh, in, in putting context around some of the work that's going on. But I'm also very well, well aware and want to acknowledge that the, the work that the network has done over many years has been first rate. Uh, your continued involvement it is really important. It's great to see so many people here from right across the system. And, and I think the other important thing from days like today is not just about hearing about what the latest evidence is or what the latest information around how people have succeeded in improving. It's about taking that knowledge and taking it back to your environment, being motivated and inspired to make a difference and continuing on the good work. So I look, although I can't stay for the day, and my apologies for that, I'm sure that you will be inspired and you will learn a lot and achieve great things as you go back into your own clinical environments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nigel. I think there's a really important message there about improving patient care experience and outcomes that we're all here um, to do, so it's fantastic. So next, I'd like to introduce Lorraine, I uh, love it, and echo Nigel's um, comments about the great work you're doing. Lorraine's a lead for the Falls Prevention, um, Falls Prevention at the CEC, and uh, let's hear from Lorraine. For, and Lorraine's going to take us through the next Thank section. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to everybody, and Nigel, thank you for your time this morning and for your acknowledgement. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Um, might I just say, leading on from that, this is a team effort. Um, uh, we've had a f I've been luck lucky enough to have been supported by a number of key people. Ingrid, who works with me closely at the CEC. Um, Esther, most definitely, as the project officer for the network, who does a lot of work behind the scenes supporting you all in ensuring that there's information as well. The team at the CEC supporting us now through the um, uh, collaborative process as well that we're in for leading better value care. But you also, as uh, practitioners, clinicians, people out there meeting with patients who are at risk, you're the ones who are really driving the change. And I just want to commend that to you today and for your interest in being here. And hope through today's sessions, that you will learn and uh, be inspired to in your practice. But I also too need to acknowledge that we've been very fortunate to be supported by a strong research um, group as well, and particularly for Neuroscience Research Australia where we have a strong research community 
and uh, all those young researchers and budding researchers and graduates are here supporting us today. And also I'd like just to acknowledge the work that we will hear from, from uh, um, Ian Cameron and Sue Curl later in the day as well. So we're very blessed in Australia to have some very key, prominent worldwide um, researchers working with us to help inform the practice that we do. Before I go on, I'd just like to introduce Ingrid because we actually use Slido, um, which is a question-answer um, process which helps us to get some more direct, um, direct feedback around how we're progressing and gives you an opportunity to feed into questions as well. So Ingrid, would you like to take people through? Hi everyone, so we did use Slido last year, you may remember it. So up on the slide, you can see if you just uh, joined Slido, so it's www.slido.com, and the event code is hashtag Falls Forum 2018. If you need to join, if you want to join the Wi-Fi, you've got the details on the screen there. So we'll leave those up for another minute or so. We're going to use Slido today to ask you some questions. We want to get some feedback from the audience, but then also you're able to ask questions through Slido if you prefer. We will have roving mics after each session if there's time for questions, but you can also ask them through Slido and we'll be coordinating um, asking the speakers that throughout the morning. Okay, is that enough time for everyone with all the codes there? No? bit longer? I'll okay. I'll no, I need to. Oh, I'll, need to. I'll, we're going to go to the first poll, so I'll just leave it there for a little bit longer, then we'll switch over to Slido and go to the first poll. So once you're in Slido, if you go to the polls section, and the first poll we're going to ask is where you're from, what um, area you're working, whether it's hospital, community, residential care, um, MPS. So we'd like to know that, and we'll get that information up on the screen. Everyone's heads are down. <laughs> All right, I'll switch over now. Oh, excellent. People are already starting to fill it in. So if you go to the first poll and then put in what your work setting is. So at the moment, most people are in the community setting. There's some hospital some other hospital acute, subacute, and that will just keep going up as people put their answers in. That's great, we've got 144 people so far who have answered. Yeah, I think we'll go to 200. If we can. More if we can get 200 us. people. <laughs> <laughs> but we, as we can see, most people are from the community and hospital acute. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, everyone, for answering that. We hope that today's sessions, the plenary sessions, and then the breakout sessions, you can um, get some inspiration from the presentations today. So now we go, we'll go to our next poll. Oh, do I have to stop that, Esther? Sorry, I think first. Okay, thank you for that. Now we'll open the next poll, which is just prior to Professor Ian Cameron's uh, talk on frailty and falls. We'd like to know what do you think are the criteria for frailty? In the patients in your setting, what types of things do you think makes a person frail? So this will come up as a word jumble, so once people start typing that in, we will see the most popular words will be the, the largest in this word jumble. So definitely age is popping up as people age. Underweight, poor mobility, poor nutrition, weakness, deconditioning.
We're definitely age, weakening, weakness, poor nutrition and underweight and slow mobility. Okay, well thank you everyone and I think um, we'll find out more about these when with Professor Ian Cameron's talk. Thank you. Well that's a great start and uh, we'll see what the responses are after we've heard from um, Ian this morning. So it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Professor Ian. Um, this is the Pam Albany guest lecturer. Um, this particular lecture honours the late Pam Albany, who was a passionate advocate for accident and injury prevention in the, her various work roles. And she was the key facilitator for promoting evidence-based practice through the New South Wales Falls Policy, the Falls Prevention Program and the network. Um, Pam, Pam, we worked very closely with, and it was with her diligent work around identifying um, injury related to falls hospitalisations that was the momentum to get the funding to support the initiation of the program of work we're working on now. So I'd like now to welcome Professor Ian Cameron. Um, Ian's going to talk to us on frailty and falls. Um, Ian is a research, researcher who heads the John Walsh Centre of Rehabilitation Research at the University of Sydney. Um, and his major interests are falls, frailty and disability in older people, an obscure disi uh, disip disciple of compensation health. Ian is an NHM and MRC Senior Practitioner Fellow. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for that welcome, Lorraine. Um, yes, so I'll talk about frailty and falls. Uh, I am a researcher, but I'm also a clinician. So I've tried to produce a talk that has relevance to clinicians because I've assumed that most people in the audience, in fact, have a clinical background, and the initial poll did um, seem to support that. Um, I did want to acknowledge Pam as well. Um, I knew Pam in the early days or earlier days of uh, falls prevention in New South Wales. Uh, as Lorraine said, uh, Pam was also a, a, a wider injury uh, advocate and um, also um, I learned reading her obituary that she was an advocate for, uh, for women in the church as well. So in summary, I'm going to talk about frailty, which broadly is a syndrome in which multiple physiological processes decline, and it's an independent risk factor for falls, falls-related injury and reduced mobility. So frailty and falls are quite interlinked, and uh, as Sue Kerr will say later, also interlinking is the concept of sarcopenia. I'm particularly going to talk about a trial that uh, I did with multiple colleagues called the Frailty Intervention Trial. And in one of the components of that, we looked at the link between whether treating frailty reduced falls. And in a one line summary, we reduced frailty and some falls related risk factors, but we didn't reduce the rate of falls. This is the paper that I'll talk about, um, published in Age and, Age, Age and Aging in 2014. I do acknowledge uh, my co-researchers, uh, um, some of whom are in the audience, um, and also certainly acknowledge the uh, participating older people. It's about 240 older people and their families, and uh, there was funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council. But just some more general <laughs> concepts first. So this, this man might be familiar to some of you. Um, do you think he's frail? He's a very powerful older man. Powerful in a metaphorical sense, not a physical sense. Uh, in fact, he's had a bad year. Uh, he had a, a fall on Lachlan Murdoch's yacht and uh, sustained a vertebral compression fracture. And just reading the little that I did in the media, uh, he may have into a, 
a frail state um, as a result of the fracture and the inactivity that he experienced. And in fact, that's the, what happens to, to older people who may be robust but then have some sort of health event and then often they will become frail by the standard criteria that I'll mention in a few minutes. But is this lady frail? Um, she's not underweight. Um, but in fact, um, this lady has sarcopenic obesity and uh, she will be frail uh, using the normally accepted criteria. Is this lady frail? Well, I think that lady matches the description that you have provided uh, in the poll that we just saw. So that lady certainly is frail. If we look at frailty, there's a number of definitions and so I want to take you through those. The, I think the best known definition is the cardiovascular health study definition, first order Linda, author Linda Freed and, and uh, often known as the Freed frailty criteria. So there are five criteria and if you have three or more of them, you are considered frail and you can see there weight loss, exhaustion, weakness as defined in reduced grip strength, low walking speed and low physical activity. Um, the research group with which I work uh, prefers this definition because you can see from the frailty criteria there are potential targets in terms of treatment. And in the frailty intervention trial, we, we had targeted treatments depending on the frailty criteria that were present. There is another model, um, generally called the accumulated deficit model, uh, most well known by its originator, Kenneth Rockwood from Canada. You can't see all the items, but the, the reason it's there is that to, to show you the 70 items uh, in the, uh, it's a Canadian, uh, frailty index and uh, what's within those items, it's a mixture of health conditions, functional limitations, uh, even symptoms and so you derive a frailty index by um, um, dividing the number of deficits present for the older person by the total number of deficits. And what seems quite strange is you don't have to use the same list. So there are lots of frailty indices with different things in the list and as long as you've got more than 30 or so in the list, you can derive a frailty index which does seem to have predictive uh, ability. And so this is taking up this idea of how, how predictive it is. Um, just see whether I can no, I'll describe it, or no, I'll just describe. So <laughs> this is looking at frailty index and death. Um, on the bottom axis, you can see months after first interview. On the vertical axis, it's the percentage of people who've died. And the, uh, the numbers are the frailty index. So you can see a frailty index can be from 0 0.000, 0 to um, maximum 0.65. It doesn't seem possible to get more than about 0.6, otherwise you're dead. And so uh, where the different lines diverge is when you have a frailty index of more than about 0.2, or in this diagram 0.21, uh, there is excess mortality, uh, and that mortality um, obviously increases with time, but the, the slope of increase in mortality is you can see from that quite closely linked to the frailty index. So someone with a very high frailty index unfortunately has a high probability of death. There are other short validated assessments. There's the frail scale, which is a scale that looks at fatigue, resistance, ambulation, illness and loss of weight. Um, it said that John Morley produced this one evening at a restaurant and wrote it down on a napkin uh, after looking at the freed criteria, and I think he actually, uh, knowing John Morley, 
Uh, but in fact, it, it has been validated. And, and so it's quite a useful, quick measure. Uh, there's the clinical frailty scale that came from Canada, uses pictograms, and I'll show you that on the next slide. For that, you do need some familiarity with the older person. You can't just look at the older person. You, you need to have some background to their current situation. And the number on the clinical frailty scale doesn't um, correlate exactly with uh, FREED either. Uh, and there are other... Uh, frailty scales, Edmonton Frail Scale and the Kronigan uh, Frailty Index are, are both uh, fairly brief and, and used fairly broadly. So this is the uh, clinical frailty scale. You can see the pictograms uh, ranging from very fit to terminally ill, one to nine. Um, within the text, you can see it's a description about, um, particularly um, the descriptions relate to disability, but as I'll show you, disability is certainly highly correlated with frailty, but it's not the same as frailty. And interestingly, they score frailty with people, for people with dementia, and that's a controversial area about how people with dementia should be considered in the context of frailty. We can have some discussion if we've got time. And so if we look at frailty from a, a, a phenotypical um, approach, um, about 90 to 95% of people are obviously frail, the, the types of criteria that you put up in the survey, and 5 to 10% of people have sarcopenic obesity. So this is a ballpark figure. It will vary according to country um, and who you sample, but it's a, it's a ballpark. And so this is about... Uh, frailty not being disability, but overlapping with disability. And so this is a diagram from Linda Freed's initial paper. Um, and uh, remember, this is a, uh, the cardiovascular health study, so it's an epidemiological study. Uh, so it's not the sort of older people we see, particularly in hospital. It's a, it's a more active group. And you can see that the concepts of disability, comorbidity and frailty overlap a lot. The biggest overlap is between frailty and comorbidity. So most older people have multiple health conditions. And you can see there is, in this group, a significant overlap with disability. But in this group, which is, I stress, atypical for the people we'll see, 27% uh, of people just had frailty without comorbidity as defined and without disability. That's very different experience, but I'm just making the point that we shouldn't um, say frailty is the same as disability and we certainly shouldn't say frailty is the same as comorbidity. Most older people have multiple health conditions and are not frail. So in terms of epidemiology of frailty and falls, um, we all know that about 30% of older people in the community fall each year. Uh, frail older people are somewhere between about one and four times more likely to fall than non-frail people. And there's lots of studies, as I've said, that frailty is associated with bad outcomes. Death, I've mentioned, but also reduced functioning and admission to residential aged care facilities. For our frailty intervention trial, we needed to think about what concepts would underlie our treatment program. So we thought if frailty is pre-disability and loss of reserve, we could try and improve reserve, which I guess we think of as physically, but perhaps the psychological reserve as well. And if we define treatment broadly, we've got a number of intervention targets based on the freed frailty criteria. So we could look at exercise uh, of different types, uh, we could look at nutrition, and that's mainly trying to work with the older person on undernutrition, but some people, um, as I've stressed, it's, it might be, in fact, to lose weight. Uh, there will be psychological and social factors that are relevant, uh, and because frail older people often have um, multimorbidity, there will be issues around uh, optimum chronic disease management. So we've published our thoughts on treating frailty. Uh, it's available in BMC Medicine, so that's an open access journal that you can just Google and find. Um, 
If we then look at the link between frailty and falls, our thought processes were frailty is clearly a risk factor for falls. Falls risk factors can be assessed and given the spectrum of researchers, we had a lot of expertise with reference to the physiological profile assessment, the PPA, which will be familiar to many of you. And so we had the exercise program, which I'll talk more about, had an emphasis on strength and balance as part of our intervention. And we thought the intervention should alter falls risk and it might alter the risk of falls, uh, but we did understand early on that our sample size probably was not going to be large enough to detect a reduction in falls. And so these were the broader goals of the frailty intervention trial. Uh, we were definitely trying to provide treatment uh, and specific treatment. And looking at the interventions in the FIT program in a bit more detail, uh, you can see on the left side, uh, the free to frailty criteria. And then in the, uh, the next column, uh, conceptually the types of intervention we had in mind. So you can see an exercise program is going to be applicable for almost everybody. Uh, probably though, a nutritional intervention is going to be important. And then there, there may be psychological factors. And when we thought about this, um, we also saw that the broader concept of geriatric evaluation and management was applicable. Uh, so geriatric evaluation and management is well researched. It's been um, documented in the literature as effective over many decades. Thank you. I've got five minutes, so I'll speed up a bit. <laughs> so there were geriatric evaluation and management principles um, uh, incorporated. So briefly, <laughs> the participants in the FIT program were older, mainly women, many lived alone, could have some cognitive impairment but not dementia, mean of six health conditions, and the way we recruited, about three quarters had been hospitalised um, in the, in the uh, three months prior to the study. I'm going to have to speed up. So Freed, uh, sorry, the frailty intervention trial did reduce frailty with the number needed to treat of seven and improved uh, mobility uh, with an effect size of about 0.4. It was cost effective, had benefits to carers, and we did need to have 12 months to see a benefit. Uh, and clearly higher adherence was associated with greater improvement. So I'm gonna miss this, I'm afraid. Um, and just go to the, I'm not sure whether this starts on a click, no. Um, Esther, do you know how to start the video? Doesn't. And so this is Mrs. T and she takes a fair while and she uh, was frail on four criteria initially. If I click through to the next one, oops, <laughs> okay, and this is her after the intervention. She's become non-frail. Here we go. No, she's coming. She's she's there. Oh, it's the first one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a five second video speaks a thousand words. <laughs> uh, so we're just going to move through this quickly. So almost everybody had uh, an exercise program. It was about eight sessions. Um, about half the people had input from a dietitian, 25% from a geriatrician. And you can see a lot of people had referrals to aged care services and vitamin D and medication advice was common. So we're just going to, uh, in terms of frailty and falls, uh, the falls risk decreased in the first three months in the intervention group. In the control group, there was a progressive increase in falls risk, uh, and there was a trend to better performance in the PPA for the intervention group at 12 months. Um, and specifically at 12 months, the intervention group had better quadriceps strength and better sway, but no effect on the other 
components of the PPA and the intervention group had a slightly faster uh, gait speed and short physical performance battery score. Um, so this is interesting, I think, that 58% uh, of participants fell during the 12 months, so it's quite a high rate of falls. Um, but as I said earlier, there was no difference um, in, in the rate, incident rate ratio of falls between the two groups, but the study was not powered for reduction in falls. And uh, this quite complicated diagram <laughs> in summary shows that you need to adhere about to 40% of the intervention to see an effect on frailty um, and mobility. So treating frailty is worthwhile and can be effective, we've shown that. It's not yet known whether frailty reduces falls, I certainly think it should. Um, frailty interventions have similarities to falls prevention interventions and frailty interventions though are, main, are most commonly multi-component. So that, that perhaps is a difference or can be a difference conceptually to falls. So this is my last slide. <laughs> Um, so to give us guidance as clinicians about where the best evidence is up to, um, there has been a consensus guideline from the Asia, what's called the Asia Pacific Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Management of Frailty, a bit of a mouthful, and the recommendations are to use a validated method of assessment of frailty, to prescribe physical activity with a resistance training component, and reduce or deprescribe inappropriate medications and it has conditional recommendations around fatigue, weight loss and vitamin D. Uh, unfortunately, JAMDA, this journal is behind a paywall, um, so you have to go through a university site, uh, but I'd have to say if people email me, um, a copy might be available. So <laughs> th thank, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think this is a, a, a lot of work that's, that's developing and we want to thank Ian for his beginning work in this whole area. Um, and certainly this year for April Falls, we did do a component of the work where we are beginning to focus a bit more on nutrition um, with the, with, um, in care and how, the, how we can influence better um, nutrition in our hospitals and so on. I know Sue's going to continue the conversation that we had. So it's very important work and thank you. I've known Ian for a very long time. We used to work together in Northern Sydney many years ago in aged care services. And um, if you'd like, we will liaise through Esther with Ian in regards to this paper and see how we might be able to share some of the um, key areas of work um, that Ian has done and the recommendations there. Also for you to know that all of the presentations that you'll hear today, we will have them up on the uh, New South Wales Falls Prevention Network, including, and I want to thank Paul who videos for us each year, um, the video presentations will be available as well. So thank you. So thank you very much Ian for you today. I just want to also comment that I did forget some very other important people who are the part of the team, and that's our New South Wales Falls Prevention Coordinator Group. Some of them are here today, and if you don't know them, can you just, as Falls Coordinators, put up your hand so we can see who's in the room? Not everyone can be here. Um, I just want to suggest that they have a big brief in terms of the work they do that we're supporting. Um, and many of them don't work full time, it's attached to other work that they need to do as well. So um, that's why it's really important in the work that we do that we actually share with one another and learn from each other and collaborate. Um, and they're there to support, to support you with the influence around where to go for research work or influence in terms of um, supporting you in the work you're doing and particularly in some LHDs, uh, the activity we do when we run local workshops and forums as well. So thank you. I'd now just need to get my notes. We have another Slido question. Thanks, um, Ingrid. So if everyone could just go to again, please. We've got one more poll. And the question is, do you think you can now identify patients in care who are frail? 
Well, that's a good response so far. It's going up fast. 97% so far saying yes. 3% need some more information. That's great. Um, Ian, we do just have one question that has come through Slido for you. And the question is, um, what was the exercise regime in the FIT study? So while people are filling this in, if, if you, you're able to answer that. Yeah, so the, the exercise program, sorry, I didn't have enough time to talk about that. Uh, it was the web program or modified web program, uh, weight bearing for better balance. Uh, initiated by Cathy in the front row. Um, so in the presentation, there's a reference to the, the latest web version and whether Cathy can also um, show a little or talk a little if necessary. I did want to, to comment that in frail people, really it was just to safely stand up usually first and then lower, reduce the base of support uh, and then challenge balance um, more. Uh, and get some strength gains as a result. So for very frail people, definitely a risk of falling while exercising, uh, and, and so care is needed, I'd, I'd stress that. Thank you, thanks. And there are a few other questions that aren't related to the presentation, and we'll try to answer those through the Falls Prevention Network, I think, following the forum, or throughout the day if we've got some time. Um, so thank you everyone for answering that. We've got 84% said yes, they, can, they think they now have enough information to identify their patients as frail. Um, thank you. And please remember to ask questions through Slido if you would like and we'll um, endeavour to answer those throughout the day. Great, thanks. Thanks Ingrid. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Cathy Sherrington who is a Professional Research Fellow and a National Health and Medical Research Council Senior Research Fellowship Holder at the Musculoskeletal Health, Sid Health Sydney School of Public and Health, University of Sydney, where she leads the ageing and disability research. Mostly, um, uh, Cathy's research focuses on falls prevention and exercise interventions in older people and, and those with disabilities. Prior to completing a PhD and Masters of Public Health, Cathy was a physiotherapist in aged care and, and rehabilitation settings. Cathy's going to speak to us today on providing an update on the Falls Research Update, Falls Research, which is normally those of you who have attended before, Professor Stephen Lord, from, who's the principal lead at Neuroscience Research Australia, the Falls and Balance Research Unit. Stephen uh, sends his apologies he is overseas um, presenting at other forums and unable to attend today. But he's very capably handed over to this role to Cathy. And I know generally we get a lot of feedback around this research update. So thank you very much, Cathy, for that. Thanks, Laurie. Yes, thank you very much. And yes, very big shoes to fill. But um, yes, hopefully I can present you a useful update. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, draft Cochrane Review um, that I'm leading at the moment with um, a large team of people um, but looking at exercise to prevent falls. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of some files that I found about falls prevention um, and also tell you how I actually found those to help you find your own in future. Um, I'm going to again give an update on the gold bars um, from Stephen's slides um, and also talk a little bit about the broader context of falls prevention. Um, and so many of you would be aware of the um, view on preventing falls in community dwellers from Leslie Gillespie and others and so that's a fantastic review um, but it's become a little bit unwieldy it already had 150 trials and people keep doing research in falls and Cochrane collaboration has actually split up the reviews into different topic areas um, and so we're leading the one on exercise um, and Sally Hopewell and Sunny, Sally Lamb in Oxford are leading one on multifactorial interventions um, and Lindy Clemson, Clemson on environmental interventions. Unfortunately this actually won't be published until next year. Um, we've completed a full draft but um, we've had some feedback actually from NICE, the um, guidelines body in the UK that they'd like some more information so that it can directly um, guide, develop, directly um, influence their guideline development. So I'm just going to show you our draft at the moment. 
And so, um, because there's now many trials of exercise, there's basically, we've actually found 98 trials just about exercise um, with falls outcomes with um, nearly 20,000 participants in 24 countries, 44 new trials since 2012. Um, with the overall low to moderate risk of bias. Um, but because of that, we've now actually grouped the trials into different types of exercise. And so we hope that that actually will lead to more clinically useful um, conclusions. And so we've used the profane guidelines for um, classifying types of exercise. Um, and so the first type is actually called balance and functional exercises. And it's exactly the sort of thing that Ian was talking about, um, but really involving a kind of tailored approach and a more challenging intervention for more um, able people. Um, and so we found the rate of falls was actually reduced significantly by 26% from exercises that were exercise programs that were primarily classified as involving balance or functional training. Um, by 19% from Tai Chi, and so remember this is in the general community, and by 38% from programs that involve multiple exercise categories, which were usually um, balance and functional exercises plus resistance exercises. And so these three approaches to exercise were all effective in preventing falls. Um, other approaches to exercise, there's still not um, yet evidence that as a single intervention these can prevent falls. So that was resistance training, dance, um, and also a walking program. Um, there was an indication of an impact on fractures, um, so we need more evidence here, but around a, um, a halving in the rate of fractures, which was significant um, from these interventions that involved balance and functional exercises. Um, and we did subgroup analyses where we found that these two type, these programs were actually not more effective in people at an increased risk compared to the general population. So I think this is really important in our ongoing targeting of the general population for falls prevention, as well as those people in the community who are at some inc increased risk. Um, we also found that interventions could work just as well in group versus individual settings. So really still there's a range of options for prescribing um, effective falls prevention exercise for older people. Um, and so uh, just two of the particular trials to mention, and there's not time to go into the detail, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the trials. So this was um, a GP-based study in Germany, you know, which did find quite a strong impact on falls from exercise prescribed through general practice. Um, this is a really interesting study looking at a follow-up of um, an intervention that involved um, resistance training plus jumping. Um, exercise and initially in people who were aged over 70 obviously we'd need to be prescribing that carefully um, but basically it actually found a lasting impact on fractures when they followed people up at five years using routinely correct collected data. It's quite a small study and investigation but just gives you a flavour of some of the trials that are contributing to that evidence. And so then to just highlight those, but we can make these available as well. Um, and so to identify some newer trials for weren't included in the review, um, I did a Pedro search. So Pedro's the physiotherapy evidence database, which I was actually involved in setting up nearly 20 years ago. Um, and so it indexes pieces of evidence to guide physiotherapy practice. And we've defined physiotherapy practice quite broadly. Um, and so I did a search and you're able to search by sort of topic areas. So using the word fall in the abstract, subdiscipline gerontology, uh, searching for clinical trials that were published um, since last year um, that had a quality score of seven or more. So we can see we're able to really hone the search um, quite specifically. And so then I was able to get a number of trials and I'm um, just have pulled out some of these um, to show you. Um, but then also, so as not to be too physio-biased, um, I also did a search on PubMed clinical que queries, which is also publicly available. Um, and you can search with falls prevent fall prevention as a kind of pull-down heading, um, and you, get, you do get several thousand articles, so it does take you a bit longer to, to look through them. But yeah, just to, to give you a flavour of um, you know, how you could do such a search yourself relatively easily. 
Um, and so here's just a few interesting things that I found. Um, this is what's called a network meta-analysis. And this was published in JAMA, which is really a you know, leading medical journal. And they basically confirmed, um, and so with a network meta-analysis, you actually put all the trials in together and then use fancy techniques to compare the impacts. Um, and it basically confirms the effectiveness of exercise, but also of um, multiple interventions for preventing falls in the community. Um, so a couple of, I won't go through the detail there. Um, a couple of other interesting things. Oh yeah, this was a new podiatry intervention. So this was in the UK, um, a large trial of about a thousand people receiving a podiatry intervention. Hilton Men's from Melbourne was involved. It looked like it could have been a little bit similar to the intervention that they did there, which worked. And this also um, did have an impact on falls. So from this podiatry intervention in the community. Um, this was an interesting one. This was using um, paramedics to actually refer people to um, community falls prevention programs in the, um, also in the UK, I think. Um, it was looking at 3,000 people and they found that basically no one in the control group was referred to community programs and about 8% in the intervention group, which, you know, is pot potentially important with the number of people that um, ambulance people are seeing. Um, and it did actually reduce further ambulance call-outs, although it didn't reduce some um, overall emergency presentation. So, you know, some um, promising aspects of, of that type of intervention. Um, oh yeah, this was just a few fun studies. This was um, virtual tablet-based group exercise in Siberia, which I thought was pretty cool. So it's really just indicating, you know, the potential power of technology. Obviously, we need to sort out our um, NBN, um, but they can do it in Siberia. Um, but here they actually had kind of group exercise where people were kind of connected online and, you know, were able to interact. So I thought, and that was delivering the Otago program, and they found it to be quite acceptable to people, not yet with falls outcomes. Um, this was another one, another quite small study, but this was um, delivering falls prevention interventions in the community um, using allied health students, and that was found to work. So I thought that was another, um, you know, potentially useful implementation model that could be explored. Um, Oh, this one was quite cool. This was about slackline training, which I think is like walking along those sort of narrow lines. And so this was a systematic review of that and basically found impacts in younger people, middle-aged people and also older people of quite task-specific improvements in balance. And now, obviously, we need to be doing more tailored interventions and slackline training's not going to be for, certainly not for our frail people. Um, but I think it really does further confirm the task-related improvements in balance and also the idea that we can actually improve balance in younger people as well. So really, we should be looking at improving physical functioning in everybody, um, you know, not just targeting those people who are at increased risk. Um, so then to summarise what we found in the community, confirming really the importance of exercise, um, of the podiatry and of multiple um, interventions for falls prevention, promising ambulance service interventions, promising delivery methods with telehealth and students, and confirming the task-related improvement in balance with appropriate and challenging exercise. Um, found a couple of um, new things in hospitals. Um, and so this was um, th this idea of actually improving care for older people as a whole. And so this was actually a cluster randomised trial, um, I think in the UK, where they looked at better... Um, you know, better looking after frailer people in hospitals on medical and surgical wards rather than on aged care wards. Um, and basically with a thousand people, um, they did find a reduction in length of stay and a reduction in complications. They didn't pull out falls specifically, um, but they did say that a lot of their intervention was targeted on falls. And they also had a reduction in ICU admissions. And so I think that is really validation for some of those kind of um, quality improvement approaches in terms of improving the care of older people in our hospitals. And so that's just a bit more detail on what they actually did. 
Um, there was a couple of studies now that have looked at what we can do with people who've turned up at emergency departments with falls. Um, and so there was one in Hong Kong where they did OT home visits for people who'd been in emergency and they did find that prevented falls. So that was really interesting, I thought. Um, there was also an American one where they looked at a physio program, so delivering physio-based exercise and also referring people to receive additional interventions if they had additional risk factors. And that had some promise, there was some impact on, on some of the outcomes for that. So again, that seemed to be quite promising. Um, there was another one where it was actually a brief intervention within emergency for actually um, talking to people about their risk of falls, so not so much following up the people, um, but actually talking to them about their future risk of falls while they're in emergency, um, which also had you know, some promising findings as well. So I think that's um, you know, something else definitely worth exploring. So in terms of, deliver of interventions that can be delivered by health services, um, that better care of frail older people in hospital did prevent complications. An OT home visit after ED did prevent falls. Um, a multifaceted program, including physiotherapy prescribed exercise, also prevented falls. Um, and some promising aspects of a brief intervention in emergency departments. Um, and then residential care, I found two very interesting studies, um, both Australian, um, but it did come up through my, my international search. Um, and so this was a systematic review um, from um, Anne-Marie Hill's group in Western Australia, um, where they looked at complex fall prevention interventions in residential care. And as you'd be aware, there has been some mixed findings of these sorts of interventions. And they basically found, and so complex interventions, they looked at that as interventions that targeted the individuals and also the sort of um, the systems within the residential care settings. Um, and they actually found that overall there wasn't an impact on falls, but there was in the programs where additional resources were allocated. Now, that's obviously a disappointing finding for our um, healthcare resource people, but um, it probably rings true for those of you actually working in that sector, that you know, really allocating additional resources to these things was associated with um, additional success. Um, and then a trial which is actually being presented this afternoon in one of the parallel sessions um, from Jenny Hewitt. And so this was a trial that was undertaken um, in, I think, around New South Wales and Queensland. And so this is an individually, well, cluster randomised trial, sorry, within um, residential care, and it's called the Sunbeam Program. And it's a physiotherapy prescribed strength and balance, really individualised progressive program. And it basically halved the rate of falls in these residential care um, you know, clients, uh, residents, which, you know, is really quite remarkable and yeah, quite very impressive and fantastic that's being done here in Australia. Um, and so the details of that, um, I've just got two slides there on the intervention. So it was using resistance training machines, but then with some other options for those people who weren't able to use the machines, um, but then also challenging balance. So both static um, and dynamic balance with progression to more challenging tasks, such as sort of grapevine exercise. So really coming through from multiple studies, that need to sort of individualise the intervention and really really target um, you know, where people are at. And yes, so Jenny, I'm sure, can give more information about that in the session this afternoon. So yeah, that's a fantastic new study. Um, so basically residential care, that really the interventions did seem to be more effective when additional resource, resources were allocated and balance and strength training prescribed and monitored by a physiotherapist did prevent falls in residential aged care. And so then now, with um, great thanks to Stephen Lord um, hijacking his slides and his approach, um, the gold bar update. Um, and so one gold bar is if there's one good quality randomised trial, two gold bars if there's at least two, um, and three gold bars if there's multiple trials and systematic reviews with little inconsistency. Um, and so I divided it into different settings this time, and the ones that are high, uh, bold are the ones where something's changed 
um, from last year, from my you know, latest update. Um, but so to overview what we know works in the community, so we know balance and functional exercises in either um, group or individual settings does prevent falls. There's a range of ways this can be delivered. We know that an OT um, home safety intervention and the ones that are holes in high risk people particularly, um, we know that speeding up cataract surgery, um, we know that we're being careful with multifocal um, glasses in those who are going to So we know, um, and we know there's impact of pharmacist led education and GP medication review. And then the podiatry intervention has now got two gold bars because of that further trial. Um, we know there's evidence for withdrawing psychoactive medications and for more intensive multidisciplinary assessment for more high risk and intervention for more high risk populations. In hospitals, still two gold bars for the intensive interventions, but then I think we can now add one gold bar for the OT home visit after emergency department presentation for falls um, and also physio exercise and referral to other interventions. Um, and in residential care, so we had the comprehensive geriatric assessment, we had the vitamin D supplementation, we had the medication review, and so now I've added um, physiotherapy exercise, and I've also added a, an additional point that there's likely to be greater effects with more resources allocated to that. So, yeah, that's my overview of the um, uh, gold bar situation. Um, but then recently I've come across a few things which have made me um, sort of understand the broader context of falls more fully. Um, and so one of these is actually the work being done by the World Health Organisation in ageing. And so they've got these new guidelines of um, integrated care for older people and really looking at how we can manage um, basically the global de decline in intrinsic capacity and functional ability in older people. And so they actually define these two things quite differently and I think it's a really useful way to look at things and, you know, fits with what we're, you know, doing here. Um, so they define intrinsic capacity as the combination of the individual's physical um, and mental, including psychological capabilities. But then they look at functional ability as the interaction between the person's intrinsic capacity and the environment. And so, you know, that can be helped by things like walking aids or, you know, or even visual aids or, you know, in, any other devices that can actually help the older person to um, remain, to retain their independence and their ability to, to function in the community. Um, and so traditionally, I think the World Health Organization has focused more on the functional ability. I think this is new in focusing on the intrinsic capacity and really that fits a lot with you know what we know about actually improving people's physical functioning to um, prevent falls and also um, enhance mobility and independence. And so they talk about um, the idea of a lifespan approach and so this idea that and so the blue line here is um, functional ability, so that's with the use of aids and things, and the red line is intrinsic capacity. And so they talk about earlier in life, um, you know, these things are relatively stable, they then start to decline, and then they might actually decline you know, below the level of independence. And so they talk about that being as a significant loss of capacity. And so then they talk about the need to develop interventions at different life stages to really address this. Um, and obviously the role of, of physical activity and also um, maximising mental health and psychological well-being is really crucial you know, to, to maintaining and um, really maximising intrinsic capacity throughout the lifestyle of the lifespan. And so this is a little bit hard to see, but this is um, some evidence from the um, longitudinal study of women's health in Australia, um, where they look at these people at these different life stages um, by level of physical activity. And it's basically finding that um, people who are more active are actually likely to, um, can have up to a 15 year delay in the deterioration to the need for actually requiring assistance. And so that's how strong the potential impact impact of lifelong physical activity is. And so that's where we really need to be advocating you know, very strongly for that. Um, but then the other thing that I learnt recently is a more about um, a broader approach 
to prevention. Um, and so I went along to the um, Australian Public Health Association Conference on Prevention. And so within a lot of aspects of public health and you know, chronic disease, they're really taking what they're calling a systems approach to prevention. And I think that applies really nicely here as well. Um, and so, whoops, going backwards. Um, and so through the Australian Partnership um, Prevention led by um, Andrew Wilson at the University of Sydney. They're doing a lot about this systems thinking and they, um, on their website, they use this iceberg model. Um, and so basically here's what we're kind of seeing easily, um, but then there's a lot more going on um, behind the scenes. And I think that's really the, co the case for you know, falls and also frailty as well, that we're kind of seeing what's obvious here, but there's a lot of you know, different causes and um, you know, different things that are, are Inter inter interacting and interrelating. And so they really talked about sort of trying to understand behaviour in the social context. Um, and so I think that's where um, things like this um, behaviour change model are actually really useful. Um, and so we... It, and so this talks about the capability of the individual to behave, to engage in behaviour, so both their physical and psychological behaviour, um, their opportunity to engage in different behaviours, and also their motivation to engage in, in certain behaviours. And I think we can apply this to um, exercise, but then also to other falls prevention um, and kind of health system behaviours. And so then with this behaviour change wheel, they talk about these aspects aspects, um, but within this broader social context, and then all the broader things that can actually be influencing that, so such as funding mechanisms, you know, service availability, um, different things. Um, but within that systems model, they also took, talked a lot about how to change things and people really being able to change things within their reach. Um, and so what I've done is applied this kind of model to um, what we found about why people are physically active. And so then I'm going to argue that we can all be um, addressing different aspects of trying to get evidence into practice with things that are within our reach. Um, and so this was from the systematic that we did about um, people's views on participating in, older people's views on participating in physical activity. And so in terms of people's capability, really physical limitations came up. And so that's where obviously we have a role in, you know, teaching people how to participate in appropriate exercise for preventing falls. Um, but then also opportunity came up. And so that's really people's um, competing priorities. So people obviously have a lot of different caring needs and, you know, different you know, a range of different things that older people are needing to do, um, as well as access difficulties came up. So that can be things like the financial barriers to participating in appropriate exercise or you know, environmental limitations with actually getting there, availability of transport and things like that. And so some of these things might not be directly within our control, but I think we can sort of support people to try and overcome these barriers to sort of help them to make these changes to, um, you know, really adopt evidence-based false prevention behaviours. Um, and then motivation came up as another um, theme, and so that was um, about people's perceived benefits. And so, you know, we can do a lot there in really changing people's views and really talking to people about what benefits are, um, as well as their motivation and beliefs, um, as well as social influences. And so that's where I think we can also do a lot with talking to people and influencing health professionals about, you know, what the evidence says and, you know, and what we can do to put it into practice. And so obviously we can also use the Active and Healthy website to um, really support us in this action. And so by you know, so registering programs, um, by running programs, um, and also by letting people know that it's there and encouraging people to use it so as to join um, evidence-based falls prevention programs. Um, so and the other thing we can do is um, encourage greater investment in falls prevention activities. And so this was um, some modelling we did with um, Kirsten Howard, the health economist, which was really looking at the cost effectiveness of greater investment in falls prevention um, programs at a community level. So um, that's my overview, really, of what the current evidence says. Um, and then I think what broader 
few kind of influences we can use to help us put that into practice. So I hope that's been useful. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge the NHMRC for salary and project funding, um, as well as colleagues, staff and students who've contributed to all this work, and then the many study participants who you know, have been involved in studies around the world that have really led us to you know, these conclusions about you know, what the evidence is for preventing falls. So thank you very much. Don't run away. Thank you, Cathy. So it's always um, very useful for us to hear where the research is at, evolving work. Um, and I guess the message is fairly clear. It's around a number of things, but particularly around exercise, which has a balance and strength component, which we've all known for a while, but how we begin to really be effective in building capacity to enable that to happen. Uh, we met with the falls coordinators yesterday and had a lot of discussion around ED and how we were going to influence there and how we even identify people in the first place and how we encourage the staff to be considering understanding people when they come in, how we support and have services in place for follow-up. Very encouraged around the um, OT follow-up. Also, we're doing some work with Ambulance New South Wales. Michelle might be here today as well, influencing their practices, identifying people at risk, and our need to build more options in terms of how we can feed people into opportunities um, as well. But one thing that stroke um, in some of that latter um, work that you were referring to, it's around how we become coaches. How we support people in the conversations we have about enabling them where they're at, their understanding and what it is about their lifestyle and their life goals. And I guess I guess that's where that conversation begins. Well, what is it that's important to you? Is it important for you to be able to play with your grandchildren or to be able to lift the washing basket or to put your clothes on the clothesline? And you're not being able to do that now. So how can we support you to begin to achieve those goals? So I think there's an element of coaching in all of this and how we shift our style of communication to be um, appropriately identifying and working with meeting the needs of people. So thank you very much, Cathy. Now we have some time for questions, both for Ian and for Cathy. Um, certainly Slido, if you've got questions on Slido, we're not going to ask you any questions at this point. Um, and Ingrid will be watching that. Has anyone from the floor at this point got any questions they'd like to directly ask now? Opportunities. Yours, we've got microphones. Yes, we've got one from the floor. Ian, would you like to come up so as well, just in case? This is your opportunity, your time here you for learning. <laughs> what can we learn from the studies that were negative? And you know, um, we were involved in a big negative trial on interventions in hospital, and Bob is our curse because he was involved in another, the biggest trial, and then there was the Melbourne study. So I don't know what the opposite of gold bars is, but what can we learn from the negative studies? Mm. So um, the question was an excellent question about what we can also learn from negative studies. And yes, I, I think that's right. Um, so I guess, yeah, we do maybe need a, um, a kind of bomb <laughs> list <laughs> approach as well for things we shouldn't be doing. Um, I guess it's always challenging in sort of complex interventions and with, you know, complex situations, is it really that that approach doesn't work um, or was it an issue with the way it was delivered or, you know, was the study actually too small or something like that? But certainly there is work internationally looking at kind of disinvestment and actually providing evidence for actually what people shouldn't be doing. Um, so I agree that is definitely something to, to work on. Hi. Uh, thank you both for gone off. Um, this is a question for Ian. I'm ho I hope you'll have the answer, Ian. <laughs> uh, you said that you need to adhere to about 40% for it to be effective. Do you know how many people in the study were actually able to adhere to that 40%? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it, 
the median adherence level was 25 to 50%. So I guess roughly half. Yeah. Hi, my name's Annette and I work in the community and uh, manage an overnight respite service. We have a lot of, well, we don't have many falls, but our, my concern is the clients that suffer with uh, dementia and confusion. How, it, how do other people prevent, besides hospital one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe restraint, I don't know, prevent or decrease the risk of falls for someone with dementia? and trying to get them to adhere to these balancing exercises, so to speak, or nutrition when they may not want to eat, or swallowing, et cetera, et cetera. I find that a bit of a challenge, and I'm wondering what you think of that. And are they included in the studies, which I don't think they probably are, are they? Because they're too hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All it is, it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to comment because, yeah, this is a big issue, obviously, the, the, the prevalence of dementia is substantial. So in the frailty intervention trial, we did, we did have a number of people, maybe 20 to 30 per cent of people with mild dementia. Um, so the, the, the issue with falls prevention in people with dementia has been that um, there are quite a lot of negative studies and so the evidence is not nearly as clear. Uh, Cathy's going to comment because there are studies underway at the moment. But my understanding is the same principles are being used in those new studies, uh, but perhaps with some tweaking of the intervention and also substantial uh, emphasis on securing adequate adherence, perhaps particularly involvement of family members to a greater extent. But I'll hand over to Cathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, with regards to exercise, I mean, and, you know, Morag and you know, Jackie Close have spoken about this before, but it kind of makes sense that the same sorts of things would apply, that people or people with dementia will also fall less with better balance and better strength, but it is obviously going to be more difficult to implement the interventions. And so there have been, um, I think, three trials that thus far that have been quite small um, of exercising people with dementia that have actually halved the rate of falls. Um, and there's a trial going on in Sydney at the moment that a few of us are involved in. Um, so that's, I guess, in the, the community. Um, and so basically, I think the same principles apply, but actually it obviously requires particular expertise to actually implement the interventions. Um, and often actually working you know, with carers or other people to assist with that. Um, and Lorraine actually might be able to comment with regards to falls in hospital um, and perhaps more in your situation. One on one. And mild dementia is fairly easy. You can still get the client to uh, participate in activities or exercises. It's very yeah. hard when they're still mobile, when they start to deteriorate and advance in their dementia, yeah. that the capacity you start, that's when it starts to become a challenge, and that's when in, they're in residential dementia units, et cetera, et cetera. Hospitals uh, where they have one-to-one, -one and that's how they prevent the fall. It's sort of, well, I guess, you know, I mean, you can't prevent everything, can you? Yeah, no, I and agree. It is, it is challenging to me. It is, in people who are you know, more affected, it's more to do with sort of having safe environments and you know, that working with them so that they do feel safe, like but, you know... So that they're not, yeah. So that they are, are feeling safe and you know able to walk independently. But Lorraine might like to comment more because it is obviously a huge issue. I think there are other experts here, and Sue might actually make a comment in at some point um, around frailty and dementia and uh, and falls, particularly and in hospital. Actually, we don't often have one-on-one -on -one for people with dementia. Only those people that might be um, agitated and behaviourally disturbed. They're the ones where we might be lucky if we can get one-on-one, -on -one, and there's a whole discussion around that, but it is appropriate at certain times, and that might link with um, the, the, the clinical management of them at the time. But I think this is a whole emerging area of research, and uh, we've got a lot of work going on in our acute environment, um, particularly around confusion. Um, that's work that we're supporting with ACI through the care of the confused, hospitalised older person and their resources are available on the Agency for Clinical Innovation website in regards to that. There is more work being done through the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare with deli a delirium guideline 
but also we're moving into accreditation next year with a new standard around comprehensive care, which is bundling up uh, cognition, uh, delirium, uh, falls, pressure injury, malnutrition, nutrition. Um, uh, so we're begin beginning to look more comprehensively at the care of an older person and what does that mean. So they're the things that we're beginning to give our attention to now is how to, we can be more effective in the acute environment. The residential care sector is more challenging. I do know through our funding agreements in, in residential aged care, it is, it is more difficult to get appropriate intervention in terms of physiotherapy interventions. Um, and there are papers and submissions now with the Australian government around um, uh, improving that. And I urge you for around some of the work that's been done effectively with Jenny Hewitt, who's here today and we're presenting this afternoon, you might be interested in, um, in, in listening to the work that she's done. So it's emerging um, and we're, we're learning and we have to share what we know as effective um, at this point, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it's now my honour to... Uh, for, we're going to have a Lifetime Achievement Award. And we're actually going to acknowledge the work that Sally Castell has done. Sally is from Movement Matters. Sally is a member, has been a member of the network since its first inception 25 years ago, and that started with Stephen Lord and John Ward um, and, and in one of our then local health districts before it became an area health service back to local health districts. Um, she's an enthusiastic advocate for exercise and falls prevention and dedicated to fall prevention and maintaining health and quality of life in older people. I actually met Sally many years ago early in my career when I was working for an age, uh, for the senior adult unit, which was a health promotion unit for New South Wales Health. And we ran a number of programs and some of those programs I wished we still had access to these to this day and one of them was that we used to take people over the age of 50 over on lifestyle vacations for four days <laughs> and uh, I can assure you anecdotally we saw some magnificent changes in the life and lifestyle of those people as a result of the program and the work we did. Sally was a very enthusiastic participator in that program when we were running that and uh, I think that was probably the beginning steps of her being involved more formally um, in the work that, we've that she has progressed since. She's always staying abreast of new research findings and willingness to apply evidence-based approaches. She's been a member and continues to be working with us on our advisory committee, and she's a respected leader in the field of exercise for older people has conducted multiple falls prevention exercise training workshops for physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and exercise instructors. So I'd like to now just to acknowledge Sally. Would you mind coming forward, Sally, for your Lifetime Achievement Award? Thank you. quite sure whether I could say anything because I, I might get a bit emotional and as it's pointed out I have um, but I thought well, this would be a great opportunity for me to talk again all right so basically what I'm saying is when Stephen phoned me up and said hey hang on you've been elected for this award I thought why, why, why me because there are so many people out there who are doing so much wonderful work as we're hearing and talking about but then I turned around and I said, oh, bugger this. <laughs> um, why not? Why not? So all I just want to say just quickly is I've been very lucky with my career choice. One of the things that I've always been fascinated with is movement and how people move and how they don't move and what I can do to try and improve things that if they're not working well. So that's been my fascination throughout my whole career. My other one has been my fascination with people and how they tick. And this, again, what we've been presenting today, what Cathy was talking about, behaviour modification, and all those sort of things, I'm still learning. Every time I go out, there's always something new to learn. Um, so this is really, really what's brought my passion to doing this work and wanting to continue with it. 
Yes, as it's been said before, I have helped out with some research projects. I've tried to assist spreading that word about falls prevention um, and have tried to understand, uh, undertake the programs and, and I'm still continuing to do that. Also, I'm also trying to do some training if possible so that what I am learning and experiencing I can share with others so that they can spread the word. Um, again, I've also been extremely lucky with the people I work with. We couldn't work with a better team of people here who are learning, who are sharing. I think that's fantastic, and I think this network has a huge amount of pluses uh, to give to everybody. Um, the only thing I still think feel that we need is work to be done from a practical point of view, as I say, from an exercise point of view. I still think we need to work on that um, linking a little bit more with developing appropriate exercise programs at the right levels for the many different target groups and the different settings that there are there. Um, as I say, this network is a great means of sharing falls prevention experiences and moving forward to develop programs and initiatives. Now, I'm still having fun and learning, to, and learning and doing what I'm doing. I had this horrible fear that it was a sort of saying, hey, time to get off, time to retire. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm just still having too much fun. When I see some of my older people, and I can give a many, many examples and histories, but when I see a 91-year-old of my, and a lovely old gentleman, on a walking stick, struggling to get out of his car, to get in to do the classes, and seeing his put all his time and effort in, because he knows if he doesn't keep going, he's going to get stuck in that chair and he's going to fall over. Poor old soul, his wife has been gone to a nursing home now because she can't cope. He's left alone, but he knows he's got to keep going to support her and keep himself going. Isn't this what it's all about? It's keeping people going, active and healthy, enjoying their lives as much as they can for as long as they can. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Congratulations. So now I'd like to thank Ian and Kathy and uh, Sally uh, for your presentations today. I also want to highlight that we actually have some poster displays as well. They're outside in the foyer. And we're actually going to do a People's Choice Award. So when you registered today, you would have seen some forms, which is a voting form. We'd like you to go and view the posters um, through morning tea and which one you think is possibly the best, and just put a number on it, just for voting for one tick. Well, a knock in the box that you think is the best. And uh, leave it at the registration desk. There's a box there that we can, uh, you can put those uh, uh, forms in. And at lunch, we'll have two independent researchers who are going to do the count and make the announcement after lunch in terms of who was the successful um, poster winner for the People's Choice Award today. So please ensure that you view those posters. These are good learning experiences as well, and I know a lot of work's gone into some of these posters. I haven't a chance to look at them all myself yet either, but I do urge you to make this opportunity as well because there's a good practice in those. Now, morning tea. Um, is outside in the foyer where you, where you arrived at this morning when you went there, and it'll be in the green and Pacific rooms, and it'll be fairly obvious as you go. Um, all special dietary requirements will be served in the Greater Rex room. That's an unusual name. Um, and there'll be signage to that. So if you've got special needs diets, it's in the Greater Rex room. Please note that. And we'll start this next session promptly at 11.10. 10 past 11, thank you.